Over the weekend, comedian Aziz Ansari was talked about, written about in a publication known as Babe. The author, Katie Way, recounted a story by an anonymous woman. They used a pseudonym, Grace, to talk about her and her experience with Aziz Ansari. Now, the title or the headline of the piece was, I went on a date with Aziz Ansari. It turned into the worst night of my life, which kind of primes you for a devastating account of sexual misconduct, criminal behavior, something, something really bad. But as you read her account, you learn that Aziz Ansari was interested in having sex with her. She did not want to have sex with him. They didn't end up doing what she didn't want to do after she made it clear she didn't want to do it. And I was left wondering what the issue was. But don't take that from me. I want you guys to hear the important parts of this piece and judge for yourselves. So I'm gonna go ahead and read that to you and then we'll have a discussion. So uh, this is how it was described in the Babe piece. They walked back to his apartment building. When they walked back in, she complimented his marble countertops. According to Grace, Ansari turned the compliment into an invitation. He said something along the lines of, how about you hop up and take a seat? Uh, within moments, he was kissing her. In a second, his hand was on my breast. Then he was undressing her. Then he undressed himself. She remembers feeling uncomfortable at how quickly things escalated. Now, this was following a date that they had. Uh, apparently, they had met after an award ceremony. They were at some sort of party. He had some sort of old school uh, camera. She's an aspiring photographer, so she noticed that camera and they sparked a conversation that way. And they exchanged numbers. And then later on, when they both flew back to New York, they went out on this date. And what she's detailing here is the experience she had once they went to his apartment after the date, okay? And I'm just gonna give one more detail before they got to his apartment. Mm -hmm. She also wrote that during the dinner, in fact, I'll give two quick details. He ordered white wine and she had wanted red wine. Okay, and she also said that he got the bill and paid it in a hurry and then they went back to his apartment. So let me give you more. Throughout the course of her short time in the apartment, she says she used verbal and non-verbal cues to indicate how uncomfortable and distressed she was. Most of my discomfort was expressed in me pulling away and mumbling. I know that my hand stopped moving at some points. I stopped moving my lips and turned cold. Now that's a very important part of the piece because Grace makes it very clear that her communication was non-verbal until the very end when she made it clear that she did not want to have sex. At that point, he was like, okay, then we're not having sex. Why don't we go back to the couch and chill with our clothes on, okay? And so he didn't pressure her or force her to have sex You know, after she said no. He complied with what she wanted, so let me give you more. Whether Ansari didn't notice Grace's reticence or knowingly ignored it is impossible for her to say. I know I was physically giving off cues that I wasn't interested. I don't think that was noticed at all. He kept asking, so I said, next time, meaning asking for sex. And he goes, "Oh, you mean second date? And I go, oh yeah, sure. And he goes, well, if I poured you another glass of wine, would it count as our second date? He then poured her a glass of wine and handed, handed it to her. She excused herself to the bathroom soon after. Then she went back to Ansari, he asked her if she was okay. I said, I don't want to feel forced because then I'll hate you and I'd rather not hate you. She told Babe that at first she was happy with how he reacted. He said, "Oh, of course it's only fun if we're both having fun." Then he said, "Let's chill over here on the couch." Okay, so at that point they were hanging out on the couch, but they both still did not have their clothes on, right? When she sat down on the floor next to Ansari, who sat on the couch, she thought he might rub her back or play with her hair, something to calm her down. Okay, so. Then, so he didn't. He didn't play with her hair. He didn't play with her hair. At that point, you know, he thought, "All right, well, I don't know what the physical cues were, but he apparently tried to have sex one last time. She made it super clear, don't want to have sex. At that point, that was when he told her, "Why don't we put our clothes on and and chill on the couch?" And at that point, they did it. 
uh, as they were watching TV, a Seinfeld episode apparently, she uh, told him, you know, all of you guys are the same. She was an expletive in there. And at that point, uh, she decided to leave. He called her a cab and she left. And she just says that during the entire cab ride, she was crying. Um, so that was that was the gist of the story, and the way that it was described by her was that you know it took her a while to validate this experience as sexual assault, but that she does feel like it was a sexual assault, even though she never verbally told him, "I don't want to have sex with you," until the very end. And as soon as she said that, he stopped. So I don't. Okay, so yeah. go ahead, jump in. Okay, so look guys, it's really important in these stories to try to um, walk in the other person's foot for a second and see each other's perspective. So, and and I'm a guy, so uh, I, of course I see the guy's perspective first, I'm keeping it real on that. And, and it, back when I was a conservative, this story would have flipped me out and I would have not bothered to see the other perspective. So now even so, uh, you know, I'm, you're going to see where I come out on it, but let's let's look at both sides, okay? So first, let's look at uh, her point of view and the point of view of a lot of women, okay? So a lot of times, pressured into sex, pressured into sex, and and a lot of folks are number one. A lot of them got pressured into sex, and then they said no, and and it happened anyway. So for those group of women who have gone through a horrific experience, when they see a story like this, it is hard for them not to. Personalize it, not to feel like I was there, I was there, right? And that happened to me, and then something terrible happened to me. Now, in this case, it is certainly an open question as to whether something terrible happened next, right? And so I think that old me would have gotten angry at those people, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm asking you to do is not to get angry on either side and 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 to say, Oh, okay, I didn't have that experience. I haven't met a woman who's been nonstop pressured. And I haven't met a woman who's been assaulted, okay? So I, I, I have to jump in. Um, so I am a woman. And so, you know, my natural bias, I guess, is to understand the woman's perspective, hear her out before I even consider the perspective of anyone else. So I'm being clear with you guys about what my personal bias is. Now, with that said, as a woman, I've also had my own personal experiences that were actually shockingly similar to what she experienced that night. And I never once thought of myself as a victim. And the reason why I didn't is because as soon as I made it clear, just like she did, that I was not interested in any type of sexual relationship, the guy stopped. And for me to publicly out that person, while concealing my identity and potentially destroy his life, his career, I think is, to be quite honest with you, outrageous, okay? Now, let me be clear about something. Um, nonverbal communication is not clear, right? So what might seem like clear nonverbal communication to you might not be clear communication for the other party, which is why it's so incredibly important to verbally communicate that you're not interested, which she eventually did. And immediately after she did that, he complied. Okay. Yeah, so again, but one more, and I'm gonna get to Aziz aside in a second. But one more thing, a lot of women have, whether they were frightened or just didn't know what to do, they didn't feel comfortable and next thing you know, they were having sex, not in this case. If they had oral sex, right, and she says that he kept moving her hand down to her genitals, etc. Look, everybody's been involved in a thousand uncomfortable, awkward situations. But a lot of women have felt that way and then the sex actually happened. And they felt, ah, maybe I should have said something, maybe I shouldn't. I don't know, I got stuck in that situation and they feel terrible about it. So when they see the story, they react in a way of like, damn it, I've been there and they get mad. But it is important, so I understand that. But it is also important that we be fair to everyone involved and take every story on its own merits. And in this case, she didn't say she was, she participated all along. She participated all along. And so I, I brought up the wine thing and the hair thing for a second because why are you putting that in the story? Because it's good, it loses credibility I, for yourself. I think it's important to actually give you the exact quote regarding the wine because it's, it's in the very beginning of the piece and it really stood out to me too because of the wording that she utilized. I didn't get to choose, uh, so she was asked about the drink, uh, drank red wine, it was, it was white, she said. I didn't get to choose, I prefer red, but it was white wine. 
Like, why mention that? It's just, there's just all sorts of little, I mean, look. Some people love to mention microaggressions, right? And I feel like there are little little statements made throughout that made it seem as though she had absolutely no control over the situation, that he had 100% of the control. And I think that that's not an accurate way of depicting what actually happened. Yeah, and and so what there are many things we're worried about. One of which is that this assumes that women have no agency, that they are look, I we all want women to be strong and and independent i thought that's what feminism was about and what we were fighting for like you you know what you could say hey i prefer red wine you could say that right and it goes to a state of mind here i don't want to overemphasize the wine cuz it's not important right mm-hmm. but it goes to a state of mind and same with the hair like why didn't he play with my hair but you never told him to play with your hair how and 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 new york times writer a woman wrote i'm a proud feminist and aziz ansari cannot read your mind and that is that's of course the core of the argument and that is true so even if you're and and so sometimes i get in trouble when i say this but look if you are in an uncomfortable situation please be strong and i know sometimes it's hard and you you, you didn't being put in an awkward situation being put in an uncomfortable situation is often is not what you asked for, right? And sometimes a man is physically intimidating and you feel scared. So Whoopi Goldberg said on the view, why don't I, you just kick him in the nuts? But that, look, that's glib because a lot of times you can't do that. And so, and, and if you said that about someone who was actually date raped, that is victim blaming, right? But it is, it is also true that you should say, if you don't want to say do something, you should say it. And because he can't, because he can't now, read your mind, he can't now, read your mind. Period. And if, so if you're a woman in that situation now, I want you to, for a second, also put yourself in the perspective of a guy. He, it appears, he had no idea. You might not believe that. You might say, "Oh, he should have known. He should have known my nonverbal cues, my mumbling. Those are her words, not my words." Then, and he should have, and maybe he should have. Maybe he should, if he was a super cool guy, he would have been like, "Hey, you know what? She doesn't look like she's into it." And by the way, guys. If she doesn't look like she's into it, for God's sake, stop. Don't, you know, and not just for your sake, but for her sake, stop, right? Because this is the world we're in now. So, and and maybe that's a slightly better thing, by the way, because maybe that avoids a lot of women being put in situations where they didn't want to be in. But in terms of blaming Aziz Ansari, it's true, he can't read your mind. If you don't want him to do something, say it instead of mumbling or hoping that he understands. Your nonverbal cues. So, let so, me- and by the way, she did. She said no at one point. He said, "Let's put on our clothes and chill out on the couch," and they did. Yeah. You can If a guy who's when you say no, he puts on his clothes and he stops. If that guy is equally guilty as the guy who doesn't, well, then you've diminished what rape and sexual assault means, and you've done great damage to the movement, to this wonderful liberating movement of Me Too, which, which all, which. For all these women who were suffering under sexual harassment, sexual assault, couldn't talk about it. We just did the Eliza Dushku story yesterday. It's heart wrenching. Don't diminish that by saying a guy who said, when you say no stops, is equally guilty of, because she used the word sexual assault. So I, I want to, just to, you know, further solidify the fact that Ansari had no idea that uh, she was this bothered and uncomfortable. The next day, he had sent her a text message. By the way, this was all shown to Katie Way of Babe. Um, And he wrote, it was fun meeting you last night. And then she responded, you ignored clear nonverbal cues. You kept going with advances, Grace explains. I wanna make sure that you're aware so maybe the next girl doesn't have to cry on the ride home. And he responded, I'm so sad to hear this. Clearly I misread things in the moment and I'm truly sorry. By the way, that is now being used against him. So. There is an article in Law and Crime saying that since he apologized, he might have accidentally confessed to two crimes. These are really, really serious issues. So if you're going to anonymously accuse someone of sexual assault, you are will you if you don't understand that that could ruin his career, that could ruin his life, and people aren't gonna read the entirety of the article. They're just not, they're gonna see the headlines. And his picture is gonna go next to Harvey Weinstein's picture. And so I don't care if you got angry at Matt Damon, and maybe I'm a bad guy for saying that, but they are not the same thing. That one guy's a monster of monsters, okay? That does all of these non-consensual things. Another guy listens to what a woman said, and now their pictures are next to one another. The headlines say the similar things. 
It's not right. And when you ruin someone's life, there are oftentimes plenty of good reasons to do it. Harvey Weinstein, Roger Ailes, Kevin Spacey, the list goes on and on and on. But I think you have a moral duty to be take a little care in that process. And now I don't know, I, I hope he does. Um, based on my reading of the story, I hope he doesn't face legal consequences. But if we're going in this direction, and by the way, now it makes guys reluctant to say that, to apologize and to say that they did the wrong thing and try to see it your way. I, mean, I think I think what's lacking in this in this discussion, and I think the reason why it's lacking is because people are afraid to just come forward and say it. But if if we get blowback, then we get blowback. We're not having a nuanced discussion at all when it comes to this movement. We are not differentiating between various types of sexual misconduct. We are not differentiating between a bad date from what happened with Harvey Weinstein. We're not differentiating any of it. We're just kind of lumping everything together into one group because, you know, in some cases, women felt slighted. In some cases, women were raped. And you can't compare those two things. Well, you can't, you should compare those two things, but you can't lump them into the same group. And I think that's the big problem right now. And anyone who has the audacity to speak out against that, that unnuanced you know, discussion that's taking place in the country gets demonized. And I think that that unfortunately stops an important conversation from happening. You know, destroying the careers of people who haven't actually committed crimes, who haven't actually sexually assaulted people. That is a very scary world to live in. And I'm seeing things happen now for political reasons, with people with political agendas making all sorts of crazy accusations. And that stuff really concerns me because it does damage on so many different components of this issue. And it especially minimizes cases of sexual assault and rape when you lump everything together like this. I actually think Ashley Banfield had a, a great point about that. I want to go to that and then when we come back, I want to discuss one last thing, which is cultural difference in America. So I think millennials are seeing things differently or some portion of millennials are seeing things differently, so differently than I would say, quote unquote, the rest of us, that it, it's, it's fascinating. So first, let's go to Ashley Banfield making a similar point to Anna. The Me Too movement has righted a lot of wrongs, and it has made your career path much smoother. And here's where I'm guessing it's gonna be a long career path. You're 23, what a gift. Yet you looked that gift horse in the mouth and chiseled away at that powerful movement with your public accusation. And I'm gonna repeat this because it's important. If you were sexually assaulted, go to the cops. If you were sexually harassed, jeopardizing your work, speak up and speak out loud. But by your own descriptions, that is not what happened. You had an unpleasant date and you did not leave, that is on you. And all the gains that have been achieved on your behalf and mine are now being compromised by the allegations that you threw out there. And I'm gonna call them reckless and hollow. I cannot name you publicly and sentence you to a similar career hit as I'm sorry, because you chose to remain anonymous. Lucky you, but as you grow in your photography career, I really do hope that you remember what you did to someone else's career, all because of that bad date that was not a sexual assault, that was not sexual harassment by your description. And I hope the next time you go on a bad date, you stand up sooner, you smooth out your dress, and you bloody well leave. Because the only sentence that a guy like that deserves is a bad case of blue balls not a Hollywood blackball. So uh, look, it does damage to the Me Too movement because it allows so many guys, and I look, I know the guy's perspective. It allows a lot of guys to go, ah, I knew it was all BS from the beginning. Oh, That's terrible, it's not BS. Roger Ailes would take out his penis and chase women around the, his office. Matt Lauer had the button to lock the door behind them. I can go on and on. Harvey Weinstein would literally barge into their house and rip off their clothes and rape them. And and this is what they dealt with at work, at work. And and it was just, that's why I keep saying the, the movement has liberated millions of women. So I, I this does, the, to, in our opinion, does damage to that movement. And, and, uh, and by the way, it also pushes a lot of people to the right wing. They go, if that's the progressive position, I don't want any part of that. And, that, and here we are as progressives saying, no, it is not necessarily the progressive position. And so well, one more thing, and maybe it's, I'm a little older, 
And the person who wrote about this at, for at the Atlantic is a woman who says, look, she's a proud feminist. She went through a couple of sexual assaults, but she's a little older. For millennial women, apparently, according to economist YouGov poll, 25% of millennial each American women think asking someone for a drink is harassment. And more than a third say that if a man compliments a woman's looks, it is harassment. Not at work, just period. I don't know how we're gonna get along if that's the new standard. And um, but I, that's that's a cultural difference, and so they view the world obviously in a very different way, and they don't understand us. They're like, how could you not see that they're, that we are being pressured and we are being asked to do things we don't want to do? And this is, if I like the guy, then yes, great. But if I don't, it's terrible, right? So we have to try to understand each other. And there's gonna be a lot of hurt feelings and a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication and probably a lot of anger before we get to a place where we can be joined again as one community. But right now, there is vast differences among us. And I think that this is a case that is beginning to have people say, you know, this this might have gone too far. What you just watched was one of the videos that we do today, but we actually do a whole two hour show every single day. It's a podcast, you could watch it in video or listen to it as audio. You can download it, you can stream it, and you get it completely ad free if you could become a member of the Young Turks. tytnetwork.com slash join.